Obviously, in every parable, there's something that should be taken out of it that's pretty important, pretty useful, uh, obviously, because Jesus wouldn't say so. He's giving us a truth, but in this one, I think he's giving us more than one truth. And there's something else we ought, to, we ought to look at as well. And there might be a little bit of difficulty in understanding this or some controversy or some disagreement. And this is the parable of the lost sheep or the 99 plus one. But I want to start off with something that also needs to be addressed as well. Depending upon who you ask, or who you're talking to, you may not think or agree where this parable starts. So we'll go to Matthew 18, starting verse 10. This is probably not the beginning of the parable. There's a reason why I'm addressing it. It says, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. He says, for I say to you that their angels in heaven continually see the face of my father who's in heaven. And then here it is. For the son of man has come to say that which was lost. Now, the reason why this I'm bringing this part up is because it's probably not necessary to start in verse 10, but verse 11 kind of goes with verse 10. Well, what does that have to do with verse 12? Well, here's the reason why. One, verse 11, uh, it, it, there's a textual variant. The er, most in the earliest manuscripts don't have this part there. And the reason why it's there is you see this here in Luke 19.10, which is not even about this particular parable, but it says, for the son of man has come to seek and save that which was lost. Well, this is kind of, if this does belong there, well, then it certainly is kind of going into verse 12. But for some people, they may have 10 and 11 part of this particular parable. I want to bring that up because if it does belong, it does also kind of make sense to talk about uh, seeking and saving that which was lost, which is part of this parable. I don't think that verses 10 and 11 go with this. As a matter of fact, I don't think verse 11 actually even belong. Uh, it was not in the earliest and in most of the manuscripts. And so for that reason, I would I would not use that. But I think if it was added later by some scribe, because it kind of makes sense to, to you might think about that when you think about this particular parable. And then obviously Luke 19 comes up, comes to mind. But so so you won't be too confused or if you happen to hear anything about it or there's a notation in your Bible that says that the earliest manuscripts don't have this. That's the reason why. But to get into what we know is definitely in this parable, verse 12. What do you think? If any man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go and search for the one that is straying? If it turns out that he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 which have not gone astray. So it is not the will of the Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Now, the question is, is he referring to uh, the children that was in verse 10? Could be, which is maybe why some people start the, the parable off that way as well. But a couple of things that need to be spoken of. One, he says, if a man has a hundred sheep and one goes uh, astray, well, obviously we feel like that all of his sheep are important. All of them are of consequence, even if one has gone away. Yeah, I got 99, but uh, no, I really want that one because they all are equal in his eyes. And so what does he do? If he is concerned, what does verse 13 say? Uh, if, it if it turns out that he finds it, I'm sorry, before that, I'm sorry, going back to the end of verse 12, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go and search for the one that is staying? Now, a couple of things about him leaving them on the mountain. He's leaving them in a secure place as well. He's not going to leave them out in the open range. Uh, now, someone will say, well, there's still, there's obviously always danger even on the mountaintop, but it could be that he's just leaving them in a particular place that is a lot safer. But I don't want to make too much of a point of that because again, there's still dangers in the mountain, but 13 is where it really becomes an issue. If it turns out that he finds it, um, Truly, I say to you, he rejoices it over it more than the ones that did not leave. And he's not to say that we don't have or he didn't have any regard for the ones that that remained or did not stray away. That's not his point. His point is he rejoices over the fact that someone who was lost is brought back. Someone who went astray is brought back. The rejoicing is and that's kind of the attitude. The rejoicing is or anyone that has gone astray, we should have that same attitude. Someone who is not like us, someone who is disobedient, someone who is whatever, rather than scorning that person, rather than ridiculing that person, we rejoice over the fact that he or she is brought back. And he says he rejoices over it more than over the 99, which he which have not gone astray. So it will be, now obviously he's giving an example, so it will be 
Uh, so it is not the will of the father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Now, a couple things have to be brought up because wait a second, does that mean that sheep stray? Well, one, we're not saying we're not we're not saying that these are believers who stray, but these are people that should be part of his and he has gone to get them. Think of it that way. You've got sheep, some that don't know that they are sheep, some that maybe even in their mind don't want to be sheep. And so what does he do? He goes and get them. Now, how can a person who is a sheep or maybe another sheep not want to be? Well, similarly with us, there were times in our lives where we didn't want to be Christians, where we wanted to do our own thing. But scripturally, scripture says, tells us that the sheep that we have, that, that he has, were given to him, whether the sheep know it or not. And so all of us at one point in time, before we realized we were sheep, before he brought us in, and remember, he brings us in, before that happened, we didn't, in many cases, want to be sheep. I know I didn't, and many of you have the same sort of testimony. And so here we have a sheep that was lost, where they didn't. Now, obviously, in this regard, he's clearly speaking of, or I shouldn't say clearly, but uh, the, the the allusion to it being Israel uh, can't be missed as well. If someone says he's speaking about Israel, I have no problem with that. If he's speaking about all of Christians in general, I have no problem with that. As a matter of fact, that's probably the same way because he's speaking of He's relating to salvation, and in all of his parables, he tends to make that kind of the, the focus. The kingdom of heaven is like this. So it is not the will of your father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Now, he's always speaking in terms of the kingdom of heaven, and so I would say that this is probably the same thing. So I would not necessarily equate it to being Israel only as far as being a lost sheep, just anyone that, that has gone astray or that has moved away from him. Now, if someone wants to say, well, wait a minute, Corey, I thought true sheep don't stray. And that's true. In John 10, speaking in verse four, notice what it says. He says, when he puts out all his own sheep, speaking of his sheep, he goes ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger, they will never, ever, ever. They simply will not follow, but flee from that stranger because they do not know the strangers. So the question is then, Corey, wait a second, I thought sheep don't stray away, don't well his sheep don't stray away. And so I think that he's just trying to make a point. He's not giving the totality of salvation in this one parable. He's making a point about, about uh, salvation. But let's say if this is, if we want to take Matthew to be speaking of those that are already saved, that have placed their faith in Christ, which I don't know that you necessarily can, but even if you did, what's the outcome? What the same outcome that we see in John 6, where he says is the father's will that all that's been given to him, he shall lose none. So we go back to chapter 10, I mean, chapter 18 of Matthew. He says, so it is the will of your father who is in heaven that not one that I'm sorry, that one of these little ones should perish. So ultimately it still works out. Do sheep, even the greatest of sheep, <laughs> funny statement, the greatest of sheep, do they ever in any way stray just a little bit? Yes, they do. That's just the nature of sheep. Sheep have uh, an, an unintelligent mind, a wayward mind. And so while they're walking, they can get distracted and nibble a little bit here, nibble there, nibble here, nibble there. And before you know it, they look up, they are lost. They are away from the, not intentionally, they may have been off the beaten path, what have you, they become lost. It's not that the, that the sheep is intentionally trying to get away, but they just become lost. That's what sheep do. Sheep are not trying to get away from the shepherd, but they can find themselves away from the shepherd. And if that happens, what does he promise to do to bring them back? So ultimately, the result is still the same, that that sheep will not be lost. And that's why he says, so it is the will of your father who is in heaven that one of these little ones would not perish. Not one will perish. The same is stated in John 6, 37 through 39 as well, says that all of his sheep, all the ones the father's given him, he will raise them in the last day and he will lose none. So I think that's two important lessons. One, when someone is brought back either for correction, because Christians can need corrections, Christians can um, go astray in terms of their, their behavior and so forth. They can find themselves lost. They can find themselves doing things they shouldn't do or getting, getting involved in something they shouldn't and find themselves in a place they shouldn't be, rest assured, two things. One, he's coming back to get his. They are his own sheep. Two, we are to rejoice over that. We are not to look down. We're not to scorn them. We're not to shame, 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 or to try to shame them. That's No, we are to rejoice as well, just like heaven will. So we don't want to be the ones that are 
uh, upset or bothered because he's brought him back. We want to do just what heaven's doing. That's cheering the person who was brought back, who was restored. Again, it's it's clear in scriptures that even a believer can go astray, not in terms of straying away from the faith or leaving him, but find themselves doing something and then correction occurs. And then what does he do? He brings him back, brings him close to his breast, uh, holding him, showing him love and bringing them back. And he's made a promise that not one sheep of his will ever be lost. That's the point of this, that not one sheep will ever be lost. If we get caught up in the weeds and wonder, well, wait a second, I thought sheep don't stray. Sheep don't ultimately stray, walk away. There's no intentionality of the sheep moving away from him. But can a sheep find himself in a place where he didn't intend to be? We all have been there and still have been saved. You can be a Christian and end up in do, end up doing something that you probably ought not do. And you're in a place where you didn't want to be. And what happens through the power of the Holy Spirit, the Lord comes back and brings you back. Why? Because he's made this promise that he will not lose one. Amen.